The most promising approach to explaining the beginning of the universe physically is a speculative idea called quantum creation of universes. This idea is based on an analogy with the unquestionably real effect called the quantum creation of particles. This effect sounds mysterious and profound, and perhaps it is. But it's a fact of everyday life familiar to all of us. Every time you walk into a dark room and flip on the light switch, you cause a flood of, partic you, you cause a flood of particles to be created, namely particles of light called photons. Other kinds of particles, even the massy kind that make up what we think of as ordinary matter, such as electrons or protons, can be created, though these have to be created in conjunction with antiparticles. For example, an electron can be created along with an anti-electron, called a positron, and a proton can be created along with an antiproton. Such pair creation is a w uh, such pair creation can happen in several ways. For example, in an intense electric field, an electron-positron pair can suddenly appear out of the vacuum by what is called a quantum fluctuation or a quantum tunneling. Pair creation is a well-understood effect which has been observed countless times in the laboratory and the probability of its happening in various circumstances can be calculated precisely using the mathematical machinery of quantum field theory. When an electron-positron pair is created, it isn't produced out of nothing. The electron-positron pair has energy, including the mc squared each particle has from its mass. Since energy is conserved, that energy must have come from somewhere. For example, when pair creation occurs in an intense electric field, what happens is some of the energy stored in the electric field is converted into the energy associated with the masses of the electron and positron. One starts with an electric field and ends up with an electron, a positron, and a somewhat weaker electric field. This creation is really just a transition of matter and energy from one form to another. In quantum field theory, particles are excitations, or if you will, disturbances, of fields. So for example, there's an electron field that extends throughout all of space and time. When that field is disturbed, waves develop in it, just as when a pond is disturbed, ripples are produced. Quantum mechanics says that waves and particles are two different ways of looking at the same thing. So producing ripples in the electron field is equivalent to producing electron particles and antiparticles. We can push the pond analogy further. A pond that is still and a pond that has ripples in it are the same physical system in different stages of agitation, states, I should say, of agitation. In the same way, a situation in which there are no electrons or positrons and a situation where there is an electron-positron pair or several electron-positron pairs are really just different states of agitation of the same system, namely the electron field. Actually, one should not think of the electron field in isolation. It's merely part of a greater system that encompasses many other kinds of fields, including electromagnetic fields, neutrino fields, gravitational fields, quark fields, and so on. When an intense electric field results in electron-positron pair creation, what is happening is that a disturbance of the electromagnetic field is causing a disturbance of the electron field. This is similar to the way that a disturbance of the air a breeze, might produce a disturbance of the water in a pond, ripples. In other words, the greater system, encompassing all the different kinds of fields that interact with each other, is making a transition from one of its many possible states to another. In physics, one always considers some definite system which has various possible states and is governed by dynamical laws which depend on the nature of the specific system and by the overarching principles of quantum mechanics, which apply to all systems. The dynamical laws and the principles of quantum mechanics allow one to calculate the probabilities of the system making a transition from one of its states to another. The system might comprise only electrons, positrons, and electromagnetic fields, 
in which case the dynamical laws are called quantum electrodynamics, or the system could be a simple pendulum, or a hydrogen atom, or the whole universe. The idea of the quantum creation of universes pushes the mathematics of quantum theory to its logical limit, and maybe even beyond it. Here, one contemplates not merely, the pair of, uh, not merely a pair of particles suddenly appearing in empty space by a quantum fluctuation or quantum tunneling, but an entire universe along with its space appearing in this way. By universe in this context is not meant the totality of things, but rather a space-time manifold in which there exist fields that interact with each other. Our universe, for example, has one time dimension and at least three space dimensions. There may be more. And many kinds of fields, including electron fields, neutrino fields, quark fields, electromagnetic fields, gravitational fields, and so on. There could be other universes of the same kind. The idea is that one can go by a quantum fluctuation from a situation in which there are no universes to a situation in which there is one universe, or more generally, from a situation with some number of universes to a situation with a different number of universes. Several apparent difficulties with this idea immediately present themselves. The first of these is that the transition from no universes to one universe would at first seem to violate the uh, conservation of energy. Presumably, zero universes have no energy, whereas one universe has a lot of energy due to all the matter that is contained in it. It turns out, however, that a closed universe, one whose space closes in on itself the way a circle closes in on itself, has zero total energy. The positive energy of the matter is canceled out by the negative gravitational energy. Thus, changing the number of such universes does not violate energy conservation. A second apparent difficulty has to do with time. In a conventional calculation, using the principles of quantum physics, one considers a system making a transition from one state at an earlier time, for example, an intense electric field, to a different state at a later time, for example, a weaker electric field plus an electron-positron pair. However, if we talk about a transition from a zero universe state to a one universe state, in what sense is the zero universe state earlier? Indeed, at what time was there such a state? We have already seen that time, at least as physicists understand it, is a feature of the universe. If there's no universe, there's no time. If we look at a universe that was produced by a quantum fluctuation, we can talk about time within that universe, and even about the beginning of that time, but not about a time before the universe. We have to be careful in discussing such scenarios of falling into the verbal trap of saying that first there was nothing, and then there was something. In fact, the same sloppy way of speaking is sometimes found in theological discussions of creation ex nihilo. When the church teaches that God created the universe ex nihilo, she is not saying that there was once a time when there was no created thing, a contradiction in terms, as St. Augustine pointed out. Rather, she is saying that there was no time when there was a created thing that preceded the universe and out of which the universe was made. In fact, the meaning of ex nihilo is deeper. It is saying that not only was the universe not temporally preceded by anything, but also that its creation presupposes nothing other than the will of God. If that is what ex nihilo means, do quantum creation scenarios yield a physical mechanism of creation ex nihilo, as some seem to believe? One can restate the question in this way. Do quantum creation scenarios presuppose nothing in explaining the origin of the universe? They certainly talk about a state with no universes. But a state with no universes is not nothing. It is a definite something, a state. And that state is just one among many states of a complex physical system. 
That system has states with different numbers of universes. And all of those states are related to each other by precise rules. The dynamical laws that govern the system and the principles of quantum mechanics. An analogy may be of help here. There's a difference between my having a bank account with zero dollars in it and my having no bank account at all. As far as my finances go, they may both be said to be nothing or no money. But there's a big difference. A bank account, even one with zero dollars in it, is something. It presupposes that there's a bank and that I have some contract with that bank. Those facts presuppose in turn that a monetary system and a legal system are in place. My bank account is thus a small subsystem of a much larger and more complex system that is governed by precise rules. My account has various states, a state with zero dollars, states with positive numbers of dollars, and even states with negative numbers of dollars if my account is overdrawn. Transitions are not made between these states willy-nilly, but in ways governed by the rules of the bank. For example, if the balance is negative and goes below some threshold, a rule may prevent further withdrawals and transitions to states with more negative balances. A state with a positive balance may periodically make a transition to a state with a lower balance due to service charges. Moreover, the rules may only allow transitions between states containing money of a certain type, dollars, say, rather than rubles, pesos, or euros. Moreover, I can have several bank accounts with zero balances, perhaps an account in an American bank with zero dollars and an account in a Russian bank with zero rubles. They are different and distinguishable accounts, which obviously shows that each of them is something rather than nothing. In the same way, even to talk about a state with zero universes presupposes a great deal, as we have seen, namely a rule-governed system with many possible states. In any quantum creation scenario, the rules governing the system allow the zero universe state to make transitions to states with one or more universes, but only if those universes have precise characteristics, such as a certain number of space dimensions and, a certain, and certain kinds of fields. Just as my, the rule of my bank may only allow my account to make transitions to states with dollars rather than rubles. I can imagine many different rule-governed systems. In system A, the rules may only allow states whose universes have three space dimensions, whereas in system B, the rules may only allow states with universes having ten space dimensions. The, universe, the zero universe state of, this, of system A is not the same entity as the zero universe state of system B. They are subject to different rules that give them different potentialities. So system A is one where three-dimensional universes come into and out of existence. And system B is one where ten-dimensional universes come into and out of existence. At this point, one may ask, which, if either, of these systems is real as opposed to hypothetical? Are there actually three-dimensional universes coming into and out of existence? so that the mathematical laws of system A are governing real events? Are there actually ten-dimensional universes coming into and out of existence so that the mathematical rules of system B are governing real events? Maybe one or the other is true, or maybe neither, or maybe both. Suppose system A is real, whereas system B is merely hypothetical. What made system A real? but not system B. That is the question of creation in the theological sense of the word. What confers reality on system A, but not system B? And that is a question that the mathematical rules of system A and system B cannot possibly answer. In his 1988 bestseller, A Brief History of Time, the physicist Stephen Hawking correctly noted that a theory of physics is, quote, just a set of rules and equations. 
And then he went on to ask, quote, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? The usual approach of science in, of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the question of why there should be a universe for the model to describe, unquote. Strangely enough, it seems that Hawking forgot this key insight by the time he co-authored the book, The Grand Design, in 2010. He now thinks that a mathematical model can answer the question of why there should be a universe for the model to describe. The absurdity of that, which was not lost on the younger Hawking, can be made clear by a simple analogy. A story may be a work of fiction or of history. It may describe actual events or not. A story may tell of Stephen Hawking being born in 1942 and going on to become an acclaimed physicist. Another story may tell of Stephen Hawking being born in 1842 and becoming Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Can I determine just by studying the words of the two stories which one describes a real state of affairs? Do the mere words of either story have in, them, in themselves the power to make real the events they describe? Does the mere fact that the second story purports to tell of something, i.e. Hawking, the future prime minister, coming into being in 1842, mean that the thing described actually did come into being? Obviously not. And neither does a mathematical model purporting to describe a universe coming into being by a quantum fluctuation mean that any such thing actually happens. In sum, the theoretical ideas by which physicists hope one day to describe the beginning of the universe while being very interesting and possibly correct are not alternatives to the creator in whom Jews and Christians believe. That creator is not a physical mechanism or phenomenon. He is the giver of reality. Thank you.